Patrick, right? I was born and raised mostly in Pueblo, Colorado. Uh, a local local guy, but I it was a, a dysfunctional family. We I went to 13 schools in nine school years. But then I started doing bonehead things, and then a friend of mine, she's from Mexico, she's older than me, she talked me into joining the army. And she said, do that so you don't get in trouble. And I left uh, in the military for six years. And so uh, Germany, Fort Carson, and then uh, Korea, and then Fort Carson again. Were you a single guy? Did you have a family at I that time? I an ex-wife and a daughter from my ex-wife. I married her in 1987. And how old were you in 1987? In 1987, I was 21. Okay, so um, young. At yeah. the time, I was actually uh, Colonel Clark, uh, who retired General Wesley Clark. I was his driver in uh, Fort Carson at the headquarters of the Brigade. Okay. College. It was beyond busy from 4 o'clock in the morning till 10 o'clock at night. Yeah. Um, always have been somebody that sketched okay. and, and did sketching and, and never had sculpted. Okay. Um, always, always sketched. I would okay. do murals in our military unit. I would do on books and send cartoons home to my stepdaughter and my uh, daughter from Korea. I would write makeup cartoons. Nice. And then uh, fast forward to uh, getting out of the military. I did a couple different jobs, uh, appliance delivery, uh, worked a train, and it just wasn't for me. So I started working in human services. Taking okay. care of adults with developmental disabilities. Nice. Um, worked at uh, Colorado Blue Sky when it was Pueblo County Board. Um, they, I worked in their day program. Okay. And uh, it was four dollars and twenty-five cents an hour. Oh my God! Isn't taking it? Taking care of crazy people with every need imaginable: uh, physical, mental, uh, dual. Uh, doing total care, and then went and worked in a mobile work group and then advanced into working with sex offenders that lived in residential homes. Oh, wow. No kidding. Uh, adjudicated. Uh, uh, then from there, I went to another agency and worked my way up to executive director and then opened my own company. Oh, wow. So for in eight, Puebla? In Puebla. So I owned... Uh, nice. Uh, for eight years, uh, I was uh, co-owner of uh, a mental health boarding home, and then I opened up a day program for disabled adults. Okay. My wife worked there, and then... Uh, 2008, I said, I, I'm burned out. So I started uh, artwork. I was scroll sawing uh, small projects and uh, went to Woodcraft and they had tree roots. And I said, these look like you can carve them. The guy laughed me off, said, how long have you been carving? I said, never. And then he really laughed me off. And I'm always game for a challenge. And so I said, I'll buy the root. And I went home. I had an old Dremel. And for 20 something hours, probably total, I carved. Uh, a very abstract piece, beautiful piece, and uh, took it back and showed them. Started carving those, wound up in a gallery at uh, Steel City Artworks. It was art on South Main. And that's where I met John Clay, my, okay. my amazing friend. And he told me, hey, why don't you come try chainsaw carve? And the rest is history. I would come up here and carve with John, but I never would sell here. This was his territory in my eyes. Gotcha. Even people wanted to buy my stuff. And I know it drives John nuts to this day but I did not want to sell to them. Uh, but uh, the mushrooms that are in the stomping grounds, I made those, those some of my first things. And okay. John said, you got to stop. You got to let people buy. And uh, when he got sick, then everybody started ordering them because he can't do the wood. Anymore. Which was devastating because he, he was, he still is phenomenal in what he does. He's a, a really good influence in my life. He's very positive. I when we were looking for uh, a home here in Peel, when homes came up and he would tour the homes with us and finally after probably 12 homes he said I'm not telling you anymore because he didn't think we were going to move uh, and then we, then we did so yeah uh, but Beulah I have roots here my grandparents are buried here they lived here on Grand uh, 8825 the, the Bucks little red cabin and what were they doing here they lived here from 1920 to 1973 yeah. Did he run a bit? Your grandfather? He worked for Cliff Price. Uh, Cliff Price. Uh, station. It was a gas station. Okay. A gas company. I think I've seen pictures yeah. of that. So he, he did that. Uh, okay. My grandmother was a musician. Uh, oh. And so my dad uh, and mom divorced in 73 after my grandparents died. And then they sold the, he sold the home. 
But I go up to the cemetery and see their, their tombstone. Both of my grandmothers were very artistic. My dad's mom and my mom's mom, and I think that's where the artistic side came from. Nice. My grandmother on my mom's side would do macrame and pottery, which I wish I would have done. And I always said, no, I'm not going to do it. She wanted to teach me piano, and I said, no, I don't want to do it. Yeah. And now I regret it. So family is huge for me, even though our family is split up and dysfunctional. And, you know, a lot of alcohol with my, my mother and a lot of family members. And so it's it's kind of split up. And I just enjoy, you know, my children. I have uh, three children, four grandchildren. Nice. Uh, my grandchildren are the most amazing things in my life, other nice. than my children. They, Do they live here? They Do live, uh, three live in Pueblo, and one lives in Tennessee. When I met my wife, we were both very young and uh, very, well, I was very boneheaded, and I learned the hard way. I had to learn how to truly love, and I had to learn so many different things, but I made a promise to myself that my kids wouldn't live the way I did. Not material things but the dysfunction and the yeah. moving and the, the school changes and and it, it's helped them tremendously you know i tell people a lot of times you know they they don't know my history of being a nursing home administrator and doing that and you know it's hilarious because to me they see me out here grubby and dirty and they didn't realize i ran a very successful business and, yeah you know but that being said my children and grandchildren and being with the same woman for 32 years in September is the biz biggest success of my life. So you had a career in public health, is that what you would call it? Or human services. Human services. Yes. Okay. And then, and then when you re retired from that, you found your artistic side and now it has exploded into this amazing business. Well, I wouldn't even say business per se. It's okay. It's a hobby. I, okay. I, don't, I don't really use it to try to focus on solely doing an income, you know, it's, okay. it's, it's a hobby. I mean, in this location, it's, it's pretty hard to be a business, you know, are you, are you underselling it? I mean, at times I'm underselling. No, no. I mean, your like your commitment and your, what you're doing. It looks, um, it looks pretty legit to me. Not like just a hobby there. No. Well, there's logs over there that are new from uh, the Donnellys, so they have an order. It's a bunch of owls and stuff, and then cool. these are just pieces that I'll do. So I'm gonna do a big Buddha on one of these. Gotcha. Um, do you, when you see a a piece of wood, do you like, do you get a vision? of what it is in, in there or do you, you or, know, at times I have, you know, and, and the wood's going to tell you if you're going to be able to carve it or not. And then also like we had talked about rot, if you hit a piece that has rot in it, mm -hmm. then you have to change your whole plan. What I've been able to do is talk with either myself or whoever ordered something and then cut that rot out of there and then redo it. Or they'll wind up in that little trailer and I give them to Darwin up the hill and he burns them for firewood. So. So I see you're saying like when you're carving and you hit a soft spot or a, that you didn't, you couldn't tell from the outside it was there. And then you have, well, that must be hard. It's very hard. I, I bet you. Down the I street, bet you. Uh, I hit more metal in that piece of art than I have every piece combined. Metal? Metal. Uh, chain, a hook. Um, that were embedded and it had been grown around and you around. didn't, nobody could knew it was in there. So, oh, who knew? Yeah, and so I bought a metal detector because I, I went through hundreds of dollars in chains trying to do that. It was, oh, wow. It was devastating. I, I, every day I would look at that piece and want to burn it. <laughs> every day. And I mean, but <clears throat> Maureen wanted an eight foot tall permit for Mike, and then he changed it up to 11 and a half foot tall. Anytime somebody wants a piece of artwork based on meaning, to me it's beautiful. Nice. Kind of. A lot of people yeah. reference pictures or Facebook or see something and say, I, I want exactly what you made for the potters up the road. And I'll tell them there's no exact in this. The only yeah. exact is in uh, the roadside stands where all the bears are identical. Uh, those are made on a machine. Yeah. So, but that's the difference between art, which yes. is what you do. And what would we call that? Like they're doing more production work. Yeah, Americana work or however you want to say that yeah they're, they're doing that so interesting people will come and say can you make a bear i've seen one in woodland park like this and 
I'm, I'm, I'm won't. Yeah. So I, won't, I won't emulate anybody's style. Yeah, so. well, that's that's the artist in you. When you start a log, what's the process? You Do you cut the bottom flat so that it, it's yes. stable? Yeah. And like that's step number one? Step number one, so it doesn't move. Uh, if it's a smaller one uh, where those busts are, I'll screw them into the stump to hold it from moving. Okay. If it's a real smaller one, I'll put it in that jaw horse, which locks it. Gotcha. Uh, like a uh, flat wall hanger that I call them. Gotcha. But uh, then I'll start doing it. But yeah, and debark it if I can. You don't want that bark. You don't want to cut through that. Gotcha. Uh, and chains are very expensive. Do you have a favorite kind of wood or tree to work with or do you mostly do pine or like what's that all about you know i've, uh, I've done pine i love pine um sorry i keep looking at the cars that drive by. no that's um, okay pine i like because it's softer but okay. sometimes it's real sappy okay cedar which the native bus that you had seen those are of cedar and juniper those are beautiful red green which i love but it's it's difficult working with it because of the the voids in the bark and the voids in the logs and then you got to work around it and okay the dust is irritating because oh. in the cedar closet you put those in to repel bugs uh-huh so if you breathe that in it, it can mess with you and i I've imagine the hard lesson when i first started carving respirators, respirators respirators um what's the largest sculpture you've ever made largest sculpture is 18 feet tall holy crap where's that that's in rye rye yeah. okay so and totem pole a totem pole? Is yes. it in a public space? No. It's, it's a private, private property? Yes. They don't, they don't want people driving up. So I have a question. So how does it get mounted, a sculpture? So you've got a stump and like the wizard. Yes. Like, so there was a piece of wood, big piece of wood brought here. You carved it. Yes. And then how does it get mounted and then fall over? Like, what's that part about? So... In Pueblo West, I made some totem poles, and what I would do is I learn from other people in forums and uh, a lot of carvers around the world. They communicate with, you, with each other, which is amazing. Mm -hmm. um, so I poured a concrete slab and then used L brackets and Tapcom concrete bits that went in the concrete and big lag bolts into the, into the base of the stump. The hermit, the wizard that you see down the road, uh, Mike and I poured the concrete pad, and it's such a big sculpture, it's not going to blow. Oh, it's just it's sitting there? Okay. Eventually, he might have to bolt it in there, but it hasn't budged one iota through the big winds that blew alive trees with root ball systems. Got blown over in that hasn't. And, so. and it's hard to move, you know, to... Uh, yeah, how do you do that? Do you have to have a crane and stuff? No, you have to have a friend that has an excavator. So you work with your client on the, like, they hire you to do the art, but then the moving of it and placing of it is a whole nother component? At times. I mean, I can move certain things with my tractor. There's an eight foot tall bear on North Creek uh, that I moved on the forks of my tractor strapped to it. And the sheriff didn't look too pleased when he, uh, I was driving down the road. <laughs> he flashed his lights and I pulled over and he just nodded his head in disbelief and just waved me off. So I think he wanted to see what I was doing. <laughs> That's yeah. great. Is your work primarily in the Pueblo, Bulo world? Or do you have pieces that, like where's the furthest a piece of your artwork has gone? The furthest gone? piece of my artwork is in Germany. And then another customer bought a, a piece of artwork, just a, a smaller piece and shipped it to a, a family member in Australia. So Nice. But as far as a customer calling me from Australia, no. But primarily in Pueblo, Woodland Park, some, uh, uh, Beulah, uh, uh, different parts of the state. So like if a tree goes down, like does that often like trigger a project yeah. then? It can. But also, it triggers a lot of people use it for fuel wood, which I don't blame them because of the price of the fuel uh, uh, gas and oil. So, okay. uh, you know, if somebody's got a dead tree in their yard, uh, they can call me and I'll have a tree company cut it down uh, okay. to the height that I want to carve it. And, okay. And then uh, once once we establish a budget, then I, I get it on a schedule and try to carve it. Do you carve stuff in place? Yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah, so the potters... That totem pole up there uh, is in place. That's a dead stump. Uh, I have a six-foot raggedy end that I carve for 
the Freemans over off of Douglas. Um, and so, yeah, you can carve the stump in the ground. Oh, and okay. It. And I've done that in the county and Pueblo. I've done it all over. What do you prefer, working in your studio or working, uh, you know, carving in place? What or are they totally two different experiences? Two different experiences. Here I can, there you're pushed a little bit harder because you have to do it uh, on site. Here you can either work really hard and relax real easy, or you can just get complacent and say, I'm going to go in the house and watch TV. So, <laughs> uh, no, but I, I enjoy carving at home. I enjoy uh, when I'm carving at home and people driving by and talking to me. Uh, some people say that's got to be annoying. You know, the annoying is if they pull up and they're not asked if they're, and I pull all my uh, protective equipment off and I think they want to ask about art and they ask me for direction. How do you describe your style? Uh, some of it traditional. Um, I don't ever try to uh, make anything that's realistic because it's a, it's a log. I've had people request, can you make a, a bust of my dog that passed away? Mm. And I want it to look exactly like the dog. And I'm honest with them, tell them, whatever I carve is going to be disappointing to you because that dog died. And you know, so now uh, when I carve angels, I carve them without faces. Uh, it's something I've always done. So mm. yeah. Hmm. Uh, Interesting. I like carving uh, Our Lady of Guadalupe, uh, St. Francis's. It is an honor because for the longest, I wouldn't say I was an artist. I would sit with John and we'd carve together and uh, somebody would say, what do you do? And I'd a chainsaw carver. Now I'm getting away from calling it chainsaw carving because there's a lot of other tools used. I, you know, predominantly uh, the chainsaws used to block it all out and then I use uh, other tools. So. A lot of carvers are now calling themselves power carvers. Oh, oh, I love that term. So. Do you have a favorite artist? Any medium, just like, is there some some artist that makes you, speaks to you, or that you've always followed or loved? or? Probably my favorite artist is... Uh, also does chainsaw carving, but uh, and does a lot of other tools. And he's he's Scott Dow, and he's on the, out on out east, um, Pennsylvania, I believe, or some one of those states. But his work is probably the most beautiful. Uh, it's flawless. And then Ken Tynan, he's a he's another uh, uh, carver that's amazing for but fastest carvers and competition carvers would be Bob King and he's called the King his last name's King but he's Chainsaw King and he's he's sponsored through Makita and uh, some other companies and they, he flies all around the world and that's what he does and he is phenomenal you know there's probably gonna uh, this might be key because I know I get a lot of people that'll stop by and ask if I can give them lessons and I, and I won't do that uh, John never gave me a lesson he, he just handed me a solid we kind of winged it, and I, I was a stronger guy at the time, so he wasn't worried about the dangers. In it. So, one of the things I would uh, reiterate if somebody's a, a younger person, even a female, female carvers are amazing right now. There's so many beautiful pieces of work being created by a lot of female carvers that I that I get to observe through different forums. That if anybody out there wants to try to do this, that they research the dangers of it because there's. You, you can be killed doing this uh, with the kick like a wick, a saw. rickish, yeah. Uh, there's a, a grind up wheel that's a chainsaw wheel that spins 20,000 RPMs that gets out of your hand, and people have lost their hands. Uh, and it's it's really bad. So, if people are interested in doing this, it's not something that's really easy. Okay. It's, um, have you been injured? Not really. Good. I don't wear chaps, uh, I should, but I, I'm so cautious, I don't make extreme cuts. There are some times where my neighbors probably panic because I'll cut upside down with the saw. I know the limit and where, the, where it's gonna lock up that bar, but then again, an accident can happen and there's no amount of protective equipment that's gonna guard against your neck when making those dumb cuts that you have to do. Okay. But. Um, the biggest injuries have happened me lifting logs, hence why I have tracked Okay. Yeah, I've, I've hurt my back. I've, yeah, so those are where I've been hurt. 
I never thought I would be an artist uh, per se like that. I've always been artistic, but it's it's a it's a wonderful feeling when you have a log on the ground that you can pick up, and then uh, if you're feeling right, you can make a, an eagle, an owl, an angel. Is there one particular form that gets that you make the most, like that people request a lot, or that like you just love to create? Is there? It used to be angels, and there's a reason for it. My very first angel I made, uh, my mom was diagnosed terminal with cancer, so I gave it to her. Aww. And uh, after that, um, people started ordering those. And I made a, a company, a, a friend of mine, a bunch of little ones. And then when my mom was terminal at the hospice house, uh, she had told Pastor Maple, my son's an artist, he'll make you some angels. And we were praying with her. And she had said, uh, I said, how many want me to donate, Mama? And me and my wife were there. And she said, 25. I was like, 25. So I made 10. But during that time is when my sister was sick. And uh, so any donations that I do, I always ask people to make donations to the hospice house. And they, they're amazing. It doesn't matter to me if it's Frontier uh, or Sangre de Cristo uh, Community uh, Care now, I think it is. So. But yeah, hospice is amazing. Nice. Nice. Well, that's a nice way to end, I think.